Coming up, we get left in the dust as Cherokee teenager Drake Long shows us what it takes to be a true competitor on the racetrack. We think it's funny because I'm beating all the guys on the racetrack and my parents are going to drive me to the races and stuff. And Army veteran Kenny Hicks and his mission to take care of his military brothers and sisters when they return home from the war zone. We're taking veterans out, we're taking them hunting, we're taking them on these trips. And it's, it's not just hunting, we do bow fishing and everything else too. We cater to all veterans. Plus, we explore Cherokee concepts of justice and the role our clan structure had in maintaining balance within community. Cherokee social organization, Cherokee ceremonial structure, all of these things are radically different than, uh, than what we see today because it was primarily clan-based and clan-governed. Plus, Anna Wake Rose and her 15 years of policy work on behalf of Native American tribes. It's about who we're working on behalf of and reminding everyone when we're in that room that this is not on behalf of us, this is on behalf of our seven generations down. The Cherokees. A thriving American Indian tribe. Our history. Our culture. Our people. Our future. The principles of a historic nation sewn into the fabric of a modern world. Hundreds of thousands strong. Learning. Growing. Succeeding. And steadfast. In the past, we have persevered through struggle. But the future is ours to write. OCO. 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 These are the voices of the Cherokee people. OCO, I'm Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin, Jr. Welcome to Tahlequah, Oklahoma, capital city of the Cherokee Nation. For generations, the Cherokee story has been told by others. Today, through this groundbreaking series, we're taking ownership of our own story and telling it as beautifully and authentically as we can. I hope you enjoy these profiles of our people, our history, and our culture. And please make plans to come visit us sometime. Wado. OCO, it's how we say hello in Cherokee. I'm your host, Jennifer Lauren, at the Cherokee National Prison Museum in Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Here you can learn about Cherokee law enforcement through time. We'll have more on that coming up a little bit later in our Cherokee Almanac. But first, Cherokee race car driver Drake Long is only 16 years old, but his family's support has helped elevate his skills on the track well beyond his years. I just, I love racing. That's just, I mean, that's what I do. Like, because I don't have a job yet or anything. Like, I, I look at racing as my job. Of course, I love it. And I mean, it's just, it's really fun. I love the adrenaline rush and stuff, but looking at it like as a job just makes it a little more fun for me. I'm Drake Long, I'm 15 years old, and I race dirt cars, and they are called A-Mods. I mean, I would push him around in a stroller like he was racing. Since he was probably three years old or so, he would go to the races and he would sit there and watch every race. He wasn't like most of the other kids that wanted to play around or do something. He wanted to sit there in the stands and watch every single race. I knew that Drake was gonna be a race car driver from a young age. We would take him to the races to watch his dad. He wouldn't go off and play with the other kids. He would sit and he would study every car that went by. So I thought, uh-oh, I better get ready because I think he's gonna be a driver. I was excited whenever he started racing. I've always wanted him to race. That's something I always wanted to do whenever I was a kid, so I just put him in it as young as I could afford for him to do it. I was about six years old and I ran what was called a junior sprint. I ran that at a track at Port City. He started racing the big cars whenever he was 13. I put him in my old car, this black car right here. That's what he started out in and ran three races in it. 
Greg's been pretty successful in the Modifieds. He's won five or six races since he started racing them. We race together quite a bit. I'm a lot better than he is, but he has potential to catch up with me. When I'm racing with my dad, I'm not gonna drive him dirty. He's not gonna drive me dirty, but I'm not gonna cut him any slack either, and he's not gonna cut me any. My first couple races he did, but now he, he we just look at each other like just another competitor just trying to win. He puts in the work on the race car. His daddy's not gonna hand it to him. You know, he he's puts it all in and long hours at the shop. And he's just got a lot of dedication. You know, you've got to have that in the sport. It's it's a lot in your feet. If you're good with your feet and smooth with your hands, you'll make a good race car driver. You got to look a little further than the radiator. You need to be focusing pretty far ahead of you to see what the other cars are going to do. I, I learn every, every time I'm on the track, just getting experience and stuff. As much seat time as you can get, the better the driver you're gonna be. On race day, I wake up and, um, <sighs> what should I say, Dad? Like, how do we, what do we do? Uh, sleep in and wait on that to get everything ready and load the car. Yeah, whatever. That's, that's a lie. I'm racing at Tri-State Speedway today in the PCD Modified. About everywhere I go, I'm the youngest driver. I don't really think much of it. And I, I think of myself as just another racer out there. I just come to win, don't think of anything else. The first thing you do is hot laps. That's just seeing how your car is gonna do, just making sure everything works. And then next is a heat race. It's about eight to 10 laps, just depends on the track where you go. And then the feature is about 20 to 25 laps. While I'm racing, I'm just, I'm focused. I'm just trying to hit my marks right and just be smooth and make good laps. Just keep my nose clean and not get anything tore up. Obviously, I'm just trying to win, but just try not to tear anything up and be smart and pass a bunch of cars and get to the front. My goal is mainly just to make it to NASCAR someday. That's like my main goal. I've got my permit and I'm planning to get my license this year. We think it's funny because I'm beating all the guys on the racetrack and stuff and, and I can't even drive myself to the races. My parents are gonna drive me to the races and stuff. I'm going to take my driver's test this afternoon, so I'm out here uh, practicing, getting ready for it. I'm a lot better on the track than on the streets because I've got honked at and flipped off quite a bit. So I'm more confident in a race car than on the streets, but I, I think I'll be okay. I think I'll probably pass today. I think I know how to parallel park. We'll see. I passed, so that's good. I had to do the parallel parking twice, and second time I got it. She said, uh, slow down on the turns and don't cut them so sharp. I guess I'll have to work on that too. I just hope he can go as far as he wants to in racing. Of course, I would like to see him go all the way to NASCAR, but I just hope he can go as far as God wants him to go. I hope for the future that uh, he can accomplish his dreams, you know. He, he wants to eventually be in NASCAR, and I just, my prayer for him is that God just continues to open doors and put people in his pathway to help him achieve that goal. And as long as he keeps a level head, you know, I believe he can do it.
Kenny Hicks is a Cherokee Nation citizen and Army veteran with numerous tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. Learning to live as a civilian again hasn't been easy for Kenny, yet he's made it his mission to help fellow veterans as they return home. So we're at uh, Geronimo in Walters, Oklahoma. We're partnered up with Double G Outfitters and my organization, Blue Cord Syndicate. We're taking veterans out, we're taking them hunting, we're taking them on these trips, and it's, it's not just hunting, we do bow fishing and everything else too. We cater to all veterans. We try to focus on the actual combat wounded veterans, be it, you know, the person's a Purple Heart recipient or, or they have PTSD. So I enlisted uh, June 6, 1996, D-Day. Did some deployments, I went to Saudi Arabia, deployed multiple times to Iraq and Afghanistan. I had 18 years, five months, and 27 days. I was medically retired. Kenny and his his boys were, were warriors. You know, that company that Kenny was in was definitely the go-to company. His platoon, his company, were was in the most connected part in Afghanistan. Well, I call him Dwayne. It's Kenneth Dwayne. I call him Rainy Pooh or Dwayne. I'm Alicia Kuehl, Kenny's mom. He's an amazing boy. He's my hero. He fights for his family, for his country, and for freedom. It seemed like about probably around the fifth or sixth year in, I started kind of losing him. And each time coming back, it just seemed like a little bit of him was gone. But you can look in their eyes and you can, you can see all the way to their soul, there's a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Uh, we lost some great warriors uh, right at the end of the deployment. And so those those types of things make you question why. I don't really, I don't try to focus in too much on my real bad emotions and bad demons and stuff. I try to stay as, as positive as I can now. I mean, I'm, I'm human. Everybody has those bad days, but can't help it. It's just part of human nature. The difference is what you do with it on down the road, how long you let that control you. Before every hunt that we do, we always do fried bread and chili. It's just been our tradition type thing. And uh, that's that's our motto, I think, is reset your mind, heart, and soul. And you can't do that without good food and camaraderie. So that's what we give them. She's from the Eastern Band of the Cherokee Nation. Her mother is, I guess you could say, put a spark back in me to kind of dig back into that. She taught me how to bead and you know, just kind of put me, put me in a calmness and a, a peace back in my life. And, just through that simple gesture of showing me how to bead. There's no doubt in my mind that because of Pixie, Penny has become a better person. Pixie has probably saved Kenny's life. You know, we would be talking about Kenny in a different way if if uh, if it weren't for her, so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right, eat up. We can tell you it's delicious, y'all are missing out. <laughs> There's a lot of a lot of things that go on in people's heads after those wars that you can't see. That bringing them out here, getting them in the woods, letting them sit down, turn their cell phone off, and just sit and listen and hunt, it helps reset them more than shoving a bunch of pills down their throat. I'm more interested in developing a relationship with that person and a long-lasting friendship. You know, we have a saying: you don't make friends with us, you make family. So these guys come here troubled and, and we want to do the best we can to facilitate their recovery. Now this hunt happens to be somebody that I served with. He was one of my team leaders in platoon. So we already have that connection, we have that bond. I'm Wayne Chavez from Taos, New Mexico. Out here with my father, Wayne Chavez Sr. July 8th, 2009. That's the day he mad about me out of there. He's the last face I remember. He was loading me in the helicopter, and then I woke up in Germany, and my whole life was never, ever, ever the same. I couldn't talk to people at all. I boxed up and started drinking and doing drugs pretty bad, and I woke up and told myself that I could never, I can't be doing this to myself. I needed to close some chapters of my life. We needed that break just to unwind 
it took me 10 years. Like, this is the best I've been in 10 years. And now I'm in a good place in my life. Like, if a buddy needs me or if we can see each other, I'm going to see each other. Kenny, because of the things that he's gone through and things that he's done and things that he's seen, and all, he's a point man um, for helping veterans that, that are challenged. If I'm doing this and staying busy and, and taking these guys hunting and you know setting it up to the point where they don't have a care in the world when they come out here and do this, then it's me still giving back and, and helping them. So in essence, I'm helping myself. It helps me to take these guys out. And I guess that's my form of therapy. Before we had written laws, our justice system was filtered through our clan structure. In this Cherokee Almanac, we take a look at traditional Cherokee justice and its evolution through time. For centuries, Cherokee life was governed by a belief in maintaining balance that when something or someone was taken away, it must be replaced in order for balance to be restored. This concept dictated nearly all aspects of Cherokee lifeways, but in none more so than clan law, also known as blood law. Cherokee social organization, Cherokee ceremonial structure, all of these things are radically different than, uh, than what we see today. And in addition, the political structure was completely different as well because it was primarily clan-based and clan-governed. So clan governed citizenship, but clan also was the basis of, I would say, justice. So when you start thinking about justice and righting a wrong, righting a grievance, that concept of balance is, is deeply rooted within that notion. That notion of uh, tohi, it's, a, it's kind of like peacefulness, balance. And if you have been injured or if you've been hurt by somebody in your community, how can you be at peace? So trying to, trying to make someone whole, trying to repair, how they've been injured is, is I feel, at the root of Cherokee justice. And, but that was all filtered through the Klan system. Cherokees didn't have volumes of written laws and how to construe those laws. The application of that on a day-to-day -day basis was left to the people involved. You see, it, it was simple, and Cherokees knew what their relationship was to one another and what their duty was to their family and to the clan and to the tribe. Cherokee people's relationships to their clan relatives built a strong communal ethic that was accompanied by a deep understanding of one's responsibilities to one another. Those were deterrents for you to behave appropriately and to not injure other people and to not to not do wrong, essentially. Because if you couldn't pay for it, your clan relatives would have to pay for it for you. And by paying for it, that can mean a lot of different things. It's not, it's not money. I'm not talking about money. The concept of blood law was that if someone from the paint clan killed someone from the bird clan, it was necessary. Even if that, that killing was accidental, in order to maintain a balance. The perpetrator, the killer, had to be killed. If not that person, then one of his clan. It was the duty of the clan who lost someone to carry out that kind of execution, balancing. Now, there were ways that that could be balanced besides just killing someone. In fact, blood law was not a foregone conclusion. It was a last resort and in many cases avoided if the injured party was willing to accept something less than blood law. The decision to take a life or not was reached by consensus through the clan system. And then they go away and they fast and they pray. 
And then they come back and they say, well, here is, through, through the system of fasting and praying, here's the answer that I have come to. That decision was come to in a serious manner. It, it, it wasn't a hasty or rushed decision. Although the most extreme expression of Klan jurisprudence, blood law was a direct example of Cherokee people's commitment to maintaining balance. By the 1800s, there was pressure on our borders, and there was tension between our young people and their young people a lot of times. So our preservation as a people depended on doing things a different way. On September 11th, 1808, Cherokees wrote down the first law in our tribe's history. In 1810, a second law was written. This law did away with blood law altogether and was signed by representatives from each of the seven clans. It marked a turning point in Cherokee law and governance. It was a milestone after which we began to move toward a constitutional government. Although now illegal, many Cherokees continued to practice some form of blood law through the mid-1800s. Many of the signers of the Treaty of Nui Chota, which caused the forced removal of the Cherokee Nation, were executed in June of 1839, an act thought by some to be an extension of blood law. Let's talk Cherokee. Seo Dawdo. I am drinking water. Ama Gadi Tasca. I am drinking water. Ama Gadi Tasca. Two of us are drinking water. Ama Osadi Tasca. Two of us are drinking water. Ama Osadi Tasca. A group of us are drinking water. Ama Odadi Tasca. A group of us are drinking water. Oma Oja de Tosca. On Awake Rose worked in Washington, D.C. for nearly 15 years on behalf of Native American tribes. Although she's no longer on the Hill, On Awake continues to expand opportunities for others in hopes of creating a more equitable future. Any Native person that walks into a space in almost any room knows that they're probably the only Native person in that space. So you don't just get to be your tribe. You don't just get to share your stories. It's about who we're working on behalf of and reminding everyone when we're in that room that this is not on behalf of us, this is on behalf of our seven generations down. My name is Anawake Rose. I am a citizen of Cherokee Nation and also of Muscogee Creek descent, and I am the executive director of the Oklahoma Policy Institute. The National Indian Education Association, I was the executive director and at the National Congress of American Indians, I was a policy analyst, I was the legislative director, and then my last term there, I was the deputy director and the interim executive director. I grew up in Owasso, not too far outside of Tulsa, with my younger brother and my mom and dad. And it was as average as probably average could be. My dad worked for Southwest Airlines when I was younger and was transferred to Arizona. When we reached the first reservation. I remember him telling me about the fight for federal dollars and the requirements that were in their treaties as well as our treaties. And I remember crying, not understanding why we had been treated that way, not understanding why the federal government wasn't holding up its responsibility. I knew at that moment that no matter what I did in my life, I was going to make sure it was to give back to our people. I've been really lucky. There's really not been a job or position I've taken that hasn't directly impacted or directly worked with tribal nations. When I first got to DC, I didn't understand how it was almost a day-to-day -day fight to try to keep our programs funded across the board. The very first bill I had a chance to work on was the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. 
that they had been working on for 15 years to reauthorize. 15 years that our hospital systems and our healthcare systems hadn't been updated. 15 years of warriors that had gone up to the hill and screaming and yelling about how our people were dying and no one listening. When you start hearing those day-to-day -day stories about how federal dollars and the lack of federal policy is not supporting our children, our elders, and our communities, there's no way that you can do anything but want to stay and fight every single day for them. And then watching how states might or might not be implementing that in the best way. And so it made a lot of sense for me to come full circle and come back and work for the state. So the Oklahoma Policy Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank. Their job is to ensure that accurate data is being shared with legislatures and with the community on policies that are being worked on with the Oklahoma State Legislature. We think about politics much more as a hobby now. My team's winning versus your team's winning. In Oklahoma Policy Institute, we don't view it that way. Our job is to go out and talk to Oklahomans. Our job is to go out and to figure out how you're feeling and how we can get you to a place where our data is going to help you make the best decision. Because politics should not impact how the issues are impacting our day-to-day -day lives. I could not move back to Oklahoma without it being a deeply personal choice as well. I also have two young daughters, and so having a chance to bring them home, not only to know culturally who they are, but also just knowing aunties and uncles, knowing grandparents. I love being who we are. I love having this connection to a people and a place and the land, and I'm so excited to have been able to bring my daughters back here so that they can understand what that means themselves. I keep a leadership mantra stuck on my keyboard and it changes, right, based on where I'm at and the circumstances. And so my mantra right now is, who can I make space for at the table? I take my mentorship and the opportunity to create space for young Native women and frankly, any young boys, incredibly seriously. I was lucky enough that people invited me to the table. I was lucky enough that people decided to teach me what they felt like I needed to know, and so now that's my turn. Hawa, we hope you enjoyed our show. And remember, you can always watch entire episodes and share your favorite stories online at oco.tv. There is no Cherokee word for goodbye because we know we'll see you again. We say, Dodadago Ha'i. Wado.